Half a day. All right. Talofa Lava. So happy to see you here. So happy to see our special guest here. Uh, this is uh, quite an opportunity for us here at the University of Guam to hear from someone who's uh, uh, very special. And there's a lot of uh, intersections in her life uh, with the life not only of the University of Guam, the only member of Congress ever who is a graduate of the University of Guam, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I'm very, very happy to know that. And of course, um, in the course of that, her life has intersected with a number of people over the years here at the University of Guam, including the Yamashita family and others, and Sanchez, and of course, actually friends for a long time with, uh, with uh, Senator uh, Mary Torres. So. Uh, this is uh, an amazing uh, experience. So, uh, you know, I've known her um, since I was elected in, uh, back in the uh, early 90s to serve in Washington, D.C. Of course, uh, she was from a different political party, uh, but, you know, we were islanders, and so that always kind of uh, makes sure that you kind of work together. And uh, she is the... Uh, number one uh, most senior member of the Republican National Committee. So, you know, I, I, I want to uh, lay that out because I don't ever want to be accused that I only invite Democrats to <laughs> uh, come to the stage, you know. And uh, I, I also want to acknowledge that uh, uh, Speaker Cruz uh, kind of uh, gerrymandered the session early today so that they could come here. And uh, so we're very, we're, we're happy uh, for that. Uh, she's had, uh, you know, in addition to being the third member of, uh, uh, third member of uh, the House of Representatives as congressional delegate from American Samoa, uh, being uh, preceded by uh, the late uh, Eni Faleo Mavaenga and, uh, and Fofo Sinia. Uh, she's also uh, had many years of experience here, lived in the Marshall Islands when her Father was uh, uh, the Honorable Peter Coleman was district administrator, distad. I don't know how many people remember that term, distad. I know there's a couple of people out there who remember the, that's a really old, archaic colonial term, I want to say. Uh, distad, di uh, district administrator. And of course, also served as uh, a deputy high commissioner of the Trust Territory of the Pacific Islands uh, in Saipan. And so, uh, you know, she had the opportunity to. Uh, live both in the Marshall Islands and in Saipan, and of course here on Guam uh, as well as, uh, as she came to school here. So, <clears throat> you know, she's had, uh, uh, I was uh, just remarking how lucky we were because uh, I was watching a signing ceremony on the uh, uh, Marine Monuments uh, the other day on uh, CNN, and, uh, you know, of course, people were criticizing what uh, President Trump was doing, and some were applauding what he was doing. But standing right behind him was, you know, uh, uh, Congresswoman uh, Radawagon. So uh, she's uh, a, a force inside uh, the National Republican Party, has uh, been, uh, if you've watched uh, national politics over the years, if you've watched national conventions, she's there. Uh, she's always played uh, some kind of uh, very strong participatory role, and I think she really takes that role seriously in terms of her relationship to uh, the broader Pacific Island community. And so it's uh, with great pleasure and honor that I introduce to you the Honorable Amata Radawagon. Thank you very much, Dr. Underwood. It's indeed a, a blessing and a privilege to be here today. And I'm just delighted this is my second home. I am from American Samoa. And we do have this little custom that whenever there are two or more Samoans in the audience that we say a couple of words in the native language. So it won't take too long if you uh, will allow me. Ole a toa ia yao sa o mongo tupu, na i fo ai to fingo sa moa, pa ia le popo ma pa le solo, 
le ama mala le atunu o pele lo loto mala na fainga malo ya ai ma ngalo se leo fa anfon no foanga se itam fa ya sin o pul ngana pala langi mor sin fiel to telo le afia everybody calls me amata or aumua amata and i am from american samoa you know Samoans are very ethnocentric. In fact, they believe that Samoa is the Garden of Eden because God put Samoans there directly. <laughs> As evidence, they cite the fact that the word Samoa means holy center or um, sacred soul, sacred heart. And they're the only po uh, islands in Polynesia that have no folklore about canoes coming from somewhere else. To give you an example of Samoan ethnocentricity, I want to tell you about a high chief during World War II. As a U.S. territory, American Samoa was being used as a staging area and resupply area in the rear of the front lines where the battles were going on. But in order to use the land for military purposes, the military had to get permission from the chiefs because that was part of the deal that was struck in the deed of session. All was going well in negotiations, but then the military came upon an old chief who absolutely refused to make his land available at any price. They tried and tried to negotiate, but he wouldn't budge. When the report was read by the high command in Honolulu, Sinkpak, who was the top military commander for the entire Pacific War, he ordered his negotiators to invite the chief for a visit to Hawaii, where Sinkpak would negotiate himself. The old chief came up and was ushered into Sinkpak's office, which had a huge map of the region on his wall, stretching from end to end. Getting up from his chair and going to the map, the sink pack gestured to the chief with his arm, saying, do you see that huge land mass on the left side of the map? And the chief nodded his head, yes. That is China. Moving to the other side, sink pack continued, and do you see that large land mass on the right? Again, the chief nodded. And do you see that tiny little dot in the middle, way down below the equator, that is Samoa. The old chief got up from his chair slowly, walked over to the map, put on his glasses, bent down and peered at the little dot. Then he stood up straight again, turned to the sink pack and said, who made this map? So when Dr. Underwood invited me to give his lecture, I was more than happy to do it because it would give me a chance to come back to Guam, which I consider home, second home. Later, he asked if I had a title of my lecture. I said, yes, my road to Congress runs through Guam. I learned a lot of lessons on the way. One of the first was that I would be in the public eye because my father was prominent from his days as Attorney General of American Samoa back in 1955. And then for the next 40 years, dad would be the this dad or chief administrator of one island or another. So I was never very far from the spotlight. Second thing I learned was the importance of education that my parents would always stress to me. I grew up in American Samoa, but when my father left the governorship to become the chief executive or administrator of the Marshall Islands, my parents thought it best to send me to Honolulu to school where we had family. For the next four years, I attended Sacred Hearts Academy and lived in a convent where my dad's sister was a semi-cloistered <laughs> nun. The Marshall Islands was my first introduction to Micronesia and the next stop on my road to Guam. Then, as I was finishing up high school, 
my parents were asked to come to Saipan, where Dad became the district administrator of the Northern Mariana Islands. I first set foot on Guam while en route to Saipan. Once again, there being no college at all in American Samoa and no University of Guam, I believe it was still College of Guam. After I graduated from Sacred Hearts in Honolulu, my parents encouraged me to go to college in the States. Work hard, Amata, work hard, because God helps those who help themselves. So I remembered all these stories that Dad would tell me. He, he had a lot of little stories, and, and I think that uh, we children, all 13 of us, remember, we remembered every single story just because, um, you know, we used to joke with each other that our dad actually spoke in parables. So the story is that a man was sitting on his front porch when it started to rain. The rain came down harder and harder, and the man realized it was a flood. So the flood waters were rising, and when the water started to spill over the porch, a man in a rowboat came by, and the man in the rowboat says, Do you need any help? Come with us. But the man said, Nope, the Lord will take care of me. A few hours later, that man was standing on a chair on his front porch, and a motorboat comes by. And the man yells inside, Do you need any help? Come with us. But the man smiled and says, Nope. The Lord will take care of me. A few hours later, the man is now on his roof, and a helicopter comes by, and the pilot yells down at him, Do you need any help? It's getting late. But the man just said, Nope, the Lord will take care of me. Well, a few hours later, the flood got to be too much for the man, and he drowned. And when he got to heaven, he asked the Lord, Lord, why didn't you take care of me? I always trusted in you that you would always take care of me. The Lord said, well, I sent you a rowboat and a motorboat. I even sent you a helicopter. What else did you want? After that, I said, buddy, you're on your own. You know? But um, so getting back to... Um, where to go to college. I could have gone to the University of Hawaii, but mom and dad wanted me to broaden my horizons. And one of the reasons I was attracted to Los Angeles was that, like Islanders, we also had relatives there. But at least it, they weren't in a convent. <laughs> Just as I had gone home to the Marshall Islands every summer for years from school in Honolulu, while in college in Los Angeles, I also came home every summer to Saipan. So I, I actually spent three years in college in Los Angeles, and then Loyola decided to merge with Marymount. And even though I'd been in LA for quite a while getting adjusted, it just seemed like I needed to go home, home to the islands. So the College of Guam was now the University of Guam. I enrolled. Dad and Mom talked to the president of UOG, Dr. Yamashita, and his lovely wife, who were happy to give me a room in their beautiful home. And I cannot thank the Yamashitas enough for their kindness and understanding, and I'm just so privileged that Mrs. Yamashita and the younger daughter, um, Duchess. I knew them as Duchess and Princess. I know they have grown-up names. I think it's Velma. Uh, but I can't thank them enough. Many times I'd get out of my last class and I'd go to their home way past dinner time. And even though the family might have already gone to bed, Mrs. Yamashita always left dinner in the oven for me. And I especially loved her bistec. So, Mrs. Yamashita, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I wouldn't be where I am today without the help of this kind family. And when I, I talked to Dr. Underwood recently, 
he said that Mrs. Yamashita was still with us. And now we're so blessed to have her actually right in this room with us today. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, Mrs. Yamashita. So although I did spend three years at uh, Loyola Marymount, it was really my one year that I spent here that I truly enjoyed and cared about. And I was sorry to leave at the time Guam was on the verge of a new chapter in its history. A year later, I believe, they elected their own governor and member of Congress. The previous summer, when I was home on Saipan, I met a young man who was part of a White House National Security Task Force doing a survey of the economic development of Micronesia. So when he came to Saipan, we'd get together and talk and drink coffee. And I believe it was 1970 when uh, Antonio Wanpat came to Congress. Although I was three credits short, I could not resist the urge to take a job I'd been offered in Washington, D.C. The young man who later became my husband also would always come to Guam. And around that, that same time, American Samoa elected its own delegate at large, and I worked for him, Paramount Chief A'u Fuimaono. One thing I did do was to join the Guam Society of America in DC. So my oldest friends came from Guam. There was no American Samoa Society until much later but Guam society was already organized, so I've actively participated over the years. I then went on to work for the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, and indeed American Samoa decided to elect its own governor around that time, and then another opportunity came up to come back to Guam and Saipan. So I found a reason to come back to Guam. And it wasn't a shock to see how much progress Guam had made. Now, <clears throat> when I first ran for Congress in 1984, I finished with almost 30% of the vote. Dad's health had begun to fade, and uh, I told him I really wanted to go for Congress. Well, he encouraged me to try again, but he said, you know, Amata, American Samoa is at least 20 years away from electing a woman to Congress. You need to know that. I really know it now because it took me 22 years to get into Congress. So dad, you were right on. And uh, so d down there I was also active in the village, the local community and the church things, including the women's hospital auxiliary and mammography. We didn't have a mammogram machine, so I decided to raise funds off island and began to speak publicly about the need for one. I ran again in 1996 and came up short. In 1998, I didn't get on the ballot because my supporters wanted to also launch a write-in campaign, something that never had been done in American Samoa. The election commissioner refused to count my ballots, and asked each polling station to destroy all my ballots. Well, then halfway through the counting process, after they'd thrown away three quarters of them, I'm sure, he reversed himself and said he would count my votes. Well, I ended up with 700 votes, you know, and um, because so many others had been destroyed. And in 2000, my supporters came back again and asked me to run again. To make a long story short, I had run unsuccessfully 10 times and won on my 11th try. <laughs> so when I came to Washington in 2015, when I mentioned that I had run 11 times, people gasped in disbelief. Some even actually fainted, you know. <laughs> But the lesson I learned is never to give up, perseverance. I ran all those times because I felt that voters deserved a choice. I didn't necessarily disagree 
with the incumbent, but he had a different approach. And in 2014, the voters spoke. And that year, there were actually nine candidates running for Congress. And I said to myself, there is no way I'm going to get past any. Then Governor Tongiola, a two-term governor who had just finished his second term. And then there was a military veteran who had his own built-in base. Plus uh, the other five candidates, including myself. But you know, perseverance is something I also learned in Guam. Because I was still short of three credits and was working in Washington for the secretary of HEW, I told Mrs. Rosa Carter, she's another person I owe a great debt of gratitude to, that it would be impossible for me to physically return to take that one course in Guam. She told me, Amata, if you can get an accredited college in Washington that we can approve, then yes, you can get those three credits transferred to Guam. So instead of being in the class of 70, which really I was supposed to be, I graduated with the class of 1975, which is actually a good thing because now people think I'm much younger than I really am. <laughs> But thanks to uh, Rosa Carter, I got my degree. Every weekend I would fly home to Saipan in those days on Air Mike, student airfare, $8 one day to go on the 737. So when I first came to Congress, my colleagues knew very little about American Samoa. And I was part of the House Republican Conference. And so, because it's very rare to have a Republican delegate, they're always all Democrats, you know? And so, naturally, there were a lot of questions after they found out I ran 11 times. They wanted to know about the pace of life in American Samoa, <laughs> and would I have the ability to adjust? So all these questions, you know, and uh, a Republican Delegate, as I said, was kind of a rare bird. And, uh, but it reminded me of that story of the American and the Pacific Island fishermen. And an American investment banker was at the pier of a small Pacific Island village when a small boat with just one fisherman docked. Inside the small boat were several large yellowfin tuna. The American complimented the islander on the quality of his fish and asked how long it took to catch them. The islander replied, only a little while. The American then asked, why didn't you stay out longer and catch more fish? The islander said, with this, I have more than enough to support my family's needs. The American then asked, but what do you do with the rest of your time? The islander said, well, I sleep late, fish a little, play with my children, take a nap with my wife. And in the evening, I stroll into the village and uh, where I drink beer and play my ukulele with my friends. I have a full and busy life. And the Americans scoffed. Well, I have an MBA from Harvard and I can help you. You should spend more time fishing and with the proceeds, buy a bigger boat. With the proceeds from the bigger boat, well, you can buy several boats. Eventually, you would have a fleet of fishing boats, and instead of selling your catch to a middleman, you would sell directly to the processor, eventually opening your own cannery. You would control the product, processing, and distribution. You would need to leave this small fishing village and move to Honolulu, then to Los Angeles, and eventually New York, where you will run your ever-expanding enterprise. The islander asked, but how long will all this take? To which the American replied, 15 to 20 years. But what then? asked the islander. The American laughed and said, that's the best part. When the time is right, you would announce an IPO and sell your company stock to the public and become very rich. 
you would make millions. And the islanders said, millions? And then what? The Americans said, then you would retire. You would move to a small village where you would sleep a little late, fish a little, play with your children, take a nap with your wife, and stroll to the village in the evenings where you could have a beer and play your ukulele with your friends. Anyway, but now that I'm in Congress, I have three... <laughs> so now that I'm in Congress, I, I have three committees. When I came in as a freshman, um, I think I was one of very few who had... If you were in the majority, yes, but if you were in the ma minority, uh, you're probably not going to have three committee assignments. And these, I felt, were very relevant, not only to American Samoa, but all the U.S. territories. And as Dr. Underwood said earlier, we do work together. We work together because we're islanders. This is the way we do it. We become family when we're up there. So it's natural resources, veterans affairs, and small business. Uh, I have to say that the GOP majority has treated me very, very well. And the Committee on Natural Resources has legislative jurisdiction for the territories. So as a freshman, I chaired the Small Business Subcommittee for Health and Technology. And uh, I also was vice chairman of the Nat Natural Resources Subcommittee for Indians, Insular, and Alaska Natives. So, and my, my work on the Veterans Affairs Committee has been really exciting as well because Almost 10% of our population consists of military veterans. So I have a good relationship with the Guam representative, whom I've known for years. And actually, her dad, Ms. B's dad, uh, Mr. Zion, he worked for the Trust Territory government while dad was high, deputy high commissioner. So even though they'll never admit it, I think the other territorial representatives in Congress are happy to have me there <laughs> because I can be like a double agent. <laughs> I can actually, because I'm on the inside and go behind the House leadership lines and uh, I work with them, with all the delegates whenever appropriate. So, for example, the Veterans Choice Act, which is very big for us, is good not only for the veterans in the states, but all of the territories as well. So here we are years later, and now I'm back on Guam. As Dr. Underwood mentioned, I'm also number one in seniority on the Republican National Committee. And I, I see some former National Committee people here, uh, Doris Brooks, Mary Torres. And uh, what does that do? It, ex it expands your network. And Congresswoman Bordalio, she would know, because <clears throat> she was the senior member of DNC for years. And uh, she can tell you herself that it gives you an additional resource to work with. When she came to Congress, <clears throat> she decided to give up her seat on the DNC. But I kept mine. But, um, you know, Congressman Rob Bishop, who chairs the Natural Resources Committee, the full committee. He also served as Utah's Republican National Committee man, and we're both from the West. And when I stepped into the Natural Resources Committee that first day, I immediately had an ally and a friend. And you know, on the U.S. Senate side, um, the fourth highest ranking member of the Senate is uh, Senator John Barrasso of Wyoming. He was the Republican National Committee man for Wyoming for many years, and he also served with me on the uh, RNC. So you meet a lot of people when you serve more than 30 years on the RNC. But we even had him come to American Samoa uh, recently as part of a uh, CODEL, or a visit by the congressional delegation. So having a network to advance your legislative objectives is good. However, it doesn't always work. Now, Senator Johnny Isaacson of Georgia, he and I, I knew him since the time he was a, 
uh, he was uh, on the House side, and uh, I was a leadership staffer working for the House Republican Conference. So we'd always been good friends, but then his district included a chicken of the sea plant, one of the chief competitors to our Charlie the Tuna, Star Kissed, which has been in American Samoa for 50 years. So uh, he made things pretty tough for me. And when I passed my minimum wage bill for American Samoa, which was really critical at that time, on the House side, the bill was met with stiff resistance by my friend, Senator Isaacson. Most of the time, however, I've gotten my bills through the House and Senate and on to the President to sign into federal law. And just, I, I want to say that we say this in Samoa, and I really do mean it. it it's not I who did it. It's God who did it. But I, I, just as a freshman, I was able to get, I think, four, four, perhaps five of my bills signed into federal law by President Obama. And that's a very difficult thing to do. I even have colleagues from the states say, how do you do this? We haven't even passed one bill yet, you know? But um, because I'm also on the RNC, what it means is that I have 167 people spread out through the states and territories, and it is hugely helpful. Senator Lamar Alexander, who chairs the Senate Help Committee, is someone I've known for years. He and Dad, and I think Governor Ada, they served as governors together. And um, he and my husband served on a presidential campaign together back in the day. So here we are, and um, I have just one teeny little networking story. One of my colleagues, we sat next to each other for two years. We were classmates, freshmen, in natural resources. He was also from the West. And how they set you up on the dais is uh, alphabetically. And uh, the Republicans sit on, the majority sits on one side, the minority sits on the other side. So our names were alphabetically placed. His name began with a Z, and my name began with an R. So just recently, he left the House to become the Secretary of the Interior. And before he left, he says, Amata, I am going to look to you for a lot of help on the territories. So we've been really actually working together very, very well, the Honorable Ryan Zinke. Um, one of the reasons Vice President Mike Pence was chosen by President Trump was that he wanted him to be his ambassador to the House. So a month ago, when I learned the vice president was coming out to Asia, I pulled aside his chief of staff to urge that American Samoa be part of that itinerary on their return. So in the meantime, our former congressman, Eni Faleomavaenga, my predecessor, he passed away in February. And so I introduced a bill to name our veterans clinic after him, and uh, because I felt that he had done all the work and he had established that VA clinic and he had been a military veteran, a Vietnam veteran, he had done many things for American Samoa. And I wanted to pay him the highest tribute that I could, some way to honor his legacy at a very high level. So we arranged it and when the vice president came down, Anyway, I should tell you that my bill passed the House and Senate quickly. President Trump signed it very quickly. It was one of only 14 bills that the president had signed into law. And, uh, but it was the importance of having a network. So, and you know, just because you ask the vice president to come to American Samoa doesn't mean he ever will. But um, I called Secretary Zinke, and I asked him to weigh in with the vice president who then agreed to visit American Samoa. He reviewed our troops. We had 300 reserve troops right there in the tarmac. And we had a very nice 
uh, dedication ceremony to dedicate the new sign naming the VA clinic after my predecessor, Eni Faleoma Baenga. And um, President Trump, I had already left for American Samoa when President Trump was able to sign it into law. Uh, so I asked uh, if the Vice President could bring the pen with him to American Samoa so I could present it to Congressman Faleoma Baenga's wife. But um, so while in American Samoa, Vice President Pence said, when he got out of the airplane, it feels so good to be back on American soil. Whoa, a cheer went up, you know, the Samoan people. They loved it. I spoke on the House floor last week, and I, I know it comes as good news, but I can tell you it, it was good to hear the Vice President say, we are here for peace, we are here for the prosperity of all our people, and we are proud the American flag flies in American Samoa. So I'm convinced that it'll be incorporated into the Trump doctrine. And so what will the future bring? It's hard to say. I know there's a concern with North Korea, but to hear the Vice President say what he said just touched the hearts of all of us. You know, <clears throat> recently we had something to do with a citizenship lawsuit. And when I came into office in 2014, a lawyer showed up on my doorstep, step, my office, and he says, well, you're my client now. And I said, huh? So a group pushing for birthright citizenship for American Samoa had brought this lawsuit. So I took a look at it. My predecessor was a strong opponent of it. And so um, the plaintiffs were those people. And the, the defendants were President Obama, uh, Falo Mavaenga, the governor, and, and now myself. And uh, <clears throat> sort of underlying my philosophy is the 10th Amendment. And the spirit of it, I think, is very important the role of the federal government versus states and the people. And you know, to have an unelected branch confer citizenship on the people without their say-so, that is not the way to do this. So in Congress, I spend half of my time making sure American Samoa and the territories are included in legislation that's good for us, and I spend the other half of the time making sure that American Samoa is excluded from legislation that will hurt us. And you know, I'm reminded of uh, Governor Ricky Bordalio. He came to DC regarding a, a rule EPA had, the Clean Air Act, requiring air scrubbers for Guam. And so he, he didn't like that very much. And uh, the federal government wanted Guam to install air scrubbers. So Governor Bordalio says, we are a small island. The sea breezes take all that stuff away. You know, you, you feds, you've got these unfunded mandates. So I'm just saying, be very wary. This is what Governor Bordalio said, be very wary when the federal government says, I'm here to help you. <laughs> but, um, so I would imagine that most of you are aware that the House voted last Thursday to replace Obamacare. By the time the House had started voting, I was already in the air en route to Guam. But it, it, it probably didn't matter because I do not have a vote on the House floor. But even this bill had the, house, had the votes lined up before it even came to the floor. It might have looked like a, a one-vote victory to some of us, but I am sure our whip had several no votes lined up to change to yes votes if they were actually needed. So, you know, the title non-voting delegate, it's kind of a misnomer because other than the vote on final passage on the floor, delegates get all the rights and privileges 
as any other member. In fact, Madeline Bordalio, Kilili Sablan, and I, we actually get a bigger budget than everybody else because of our travel. Uh, the travel is based on the miles. I know Dr. Underwood is aware of this. And because our home districts are thousands and thousands of miles away from Washington, D.C., they have to give us a few extra bucks. And in my case, we only have a monopoly. We've got Hawaiian Air and uh, two flights a week. So I never fly first class. And people always come to me, hey, you need to be in first class. But you see, if I don't fly first class, I can get two round-trip coach tickets sitting down in, in the back where the tail is. And uh, I do come home to American Samoa twice a month, sometimes three times a month. So it's pretty rugged uh, scheduling. But um, let me just mention in closing some of the delegate privileges that people might not be aware of. <clears throat> I know you know that there are five members of Congress from the U.S. territories and one from District of Columbia. And, um, but not so many people realize that these territorial delegates hold all the privileges of a member of Congress from any of the states, except for that, as I mentioned, the right to vote on f the floor of the House on final passage of legislation. But as delegates gain more and more visibility through their chairmanships, people are beginning to understand the extent of their powers and perks. What exactly are those privileges? As innocuous as the title non-voting delegate sounds, I've already said it, they have all the rights uh, except that one, the final passage. But they can introduce legislation, they can offer amendments and substitutes, they have full access to the House floor, they can speak on the floor, participate in debate, manage bills, sit on committees and fully vote in those committees. It, it goes on and on. They can chair subcommittees and full committees. They can participate in legislative conference committees. They can accrue seniority. They can make nominations to service academies. They can hold leadership positions, including Speaker of the House, if they get enough votes. They are full voting members of their party's caucuses, and as such, they participate in their party's policy decisions and leadership elections. They are provided the same size office staffs and budgets, well, ours is just a little more than the state's, as the other members. And um, they are also assigned office space by seniority, just like any other member. They're able to preside over the committee of the whole. They have all the other perks of House membership. So the election of the non-voting delegates is not consequential, not inconsequential. Finally, in American Samoa, we have a saying, oleala el pule o tautua, meaning the road to leadership is paved with service. And it may have been in the old days applied to people in their villages. And today, my road to service went through Guam. My people in American Samoa were willing to agree that these things were not only in American Samoa, but Guam as well. Soifua, thank you. We'd like to open the floor for some yes, questions. I'd be happy to answer any questions. The only questions that are not good are not asking a question. Yes, sir. I'm curious. <clears throat> I, I keep wondering, does Washington, D.C. know what the H-2 issue is doing to the territories? And is there any plan for trying to... Are you referring to the CW matter? <laughs> yes. Yes, I think they are working on it. Um, and when you say it affects all the territories, it... It doesn't affect all territories the same way. I, I see that it's good for Guam, 
and Saipan, I've just come from there, they definitely need more workers. Their, st their economy is starting to boom. But uh, if I, and I am supporting that for Guam and Saipan. It uh, doesn't work for American Samoa, and if I were to try to get a whole bunch of uh, contract workers, foreigners down to American Samoa, I will be out of office so fast, it wouldn't even be funny. Yes, Simon? Yes. Uh, a young man, Tao Tao Agate, from Guam, is uh, running up to the Supreme Court to try to see how the federal uh, court system will, will look at it. And it's raised some very important issues with regards to political status and sort of the future of all of us as territories of the United States. And Guam has been very much involved uh, at his days. So I was there on the executive uh, on the Commission on Self Determination 30 years ago. Yes. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about uh, where you see Samoa and its aspirations for political status change, if any? Maybe talk a little bit about why there is opposition in, in Samoa, back, in, back at home, in to this effort to try to change the citizenship nature mm -hmm. of uh, American Samoans and, and how that different, differs from the citizenship of Yes. That's a very good question, Simon. Um, and almost along the lines of the contract worker matter, American Samoa has a different take on, on this. Now, um, we are all proud Americans in American Samoa, but uh, there are some people who do not. What it is is there, there are U.S. national. In order to be a U.S. national, you must have been born in American Samoa. There's a U.S. national who was born and raised and is living in American Samoa. Many of them come up to the States. And what happens for them is that they begin to participate in their communities, their children go to schools, and uh, for them, the logical thing is to become a U.S. citizen, which many of them do. They can do that. Um, the U.S. nationals in American Samoa, there are some who would like to be U.S. citizens, but um, there are those who don't want that because our culture, we're still living this ancient culture, which we take seriously. And um, the feeling is that uh, they ought to be able to be U.S. citizens anytime they want. Now, the problem with a U.S. national applying for U.S. citizenship is they have to apply as if they're an alien. And that is not right. That means they have to pay $595 as the fee. They've got to go to this U.S. soil that's defined as the U.S. soil that will allow you to, you know, eventually get your citizenship and all that. Now, we have asked the people, um, believe me, everybody I talk to along the way, I urge Samoans to become U.S. citizens if they want to. Um, the thing is that... Uh, they, they don't want this. Now, did American Samoa ever have a chance to be offered the Organic Act? Yes. As a matter of fact, it was in 1949 or 1950. And I think it was H.R. 45,000 or something. The White House was all in favor of it then. The House and the Senate, they were excited about it. And they were ready to push this through because Americans say, yes, the greatest thing that could happen to a person is to become a U.S. citizen. There are people who don't necessarily agree with that thinking. And um, so they brought this bill down to American Samoa, and uh, the FONO, our legislature, looked at it. And uh, in the end, they said, thank you, but no thank you. Some of us would like to be able to be U.S. citizens at a time of our own choosing. But the automatic citizenship 
would not advance. There's a fear in American Samoa. See, unlike Guam, where you have a lot of land, we don't have that much land, so we're actually stingy with our land. And so um, there is this fear that if everybody gets blanket citizenship, then uh, it's going to allow all US citizens who have the money and the ability to tempt that person to sell their land to them, to sell the land, and eventually the land will be gone. And many US nationals fear it. And also, they are living in the Fasamoa. And uh, the land and the blood are one. In the American way, land is what? A commodity. If you have money, you want to buy it, go buy it. If you get tired of it, go sell it. But with a deed of session, we cannot alienate our land. And uh, as the military, as the Sink Pact discovered when he went to go and ask this old chief about the land, it is still that way today. I, I say that um, what I've offered to our people is that I've already drafted a bill. This bill would simplify the citizenship process for US nationals. I don't think it should take more than a half an hour to become a US citizen if you're a US national. You're already inside the naturalization arena. So I don't know if that helps, but thank you for your question. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much.